evening, I want to ask you to take your Bible and find your place in Galatians chapter 5. And this evening, we're going to look at verses 22 through 23. We'll also look at some other passages of Scripture. Reminder, after this evening's time of worship and our observance of the Lord's Supper, we will have a reception for our new student pastor, Kyle Ruff, and we will be meeting in A200 for that. So I said fellowship hall this morning. It's really this way, A200. So that will be after our time of worship. We have a preschool and children meeting as we're meeting, and we have students meeting as well as we're meeting, and they are in those different groups focusing on the fruit of the Spirit as well. And the students will be joining us at about a quarter till as we go into the Lord's Supper, and they will take of the elements with us. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Father, in Jesus' name, we come and to your presence with your people this evening. And we're grateful that we have the word of God to speak into our lives this evening. Jesus, we thank you that you descended to humanity and you lived 100% God, 100% man in our place. All of the fruit of the spirit, all of these character traits we'll speak of this evening, you perfectly embodied on our behalf. Whereas these things would not be ours through our mere humanity, Jesus, you lived actively on our behalf and you accomplished these things, you achieved these things and you gave your body and your blood for us to break the power of sin. And through your blood we are forgiven and we receive life through your body. Our mortal bodies will one day be raised and even now our mortal bodies can exhibit the life of God. And during this time of worship, Jesus, by your spirit, encourage us, edify us, enlighten us, teach us more and more what it means to live the Christian life, the Christ life, the spirit life, and use this time of proclamation and remembrance and examination with the Lord's Supper to spiritually bless us and benefit us and build us up as we begin a new week. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Keen observers will notice when you study Paul's words concerning the fruit of the Spirit that he is intentional to say fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. Uh, this stands out even more when you consider in Galatians 5.19 when he spoke about what the flesh produces. He did not say the work of the flesh. He said the works of the flesh works and fruit fruit not fruits although there are nine individual fruits listed paul refers to them as the fruit of the spirit why the singular usage why the difference why change in galatians 5:19 when he said now the works of the flesh are obvious why change from plural to singular here. Uh, Paul's choice of word, the term he uses, reveals a great secret of the Christian life. It sheds light on some important, powerful spiritual truth. And if we want to really grasp what it means to have the fruit of the Spirit in our life, we need to pay special attention to his singular use of the word fruit instead of fruits. Plain and simple, his use of this word reveals that when one truly walks in the Spirit, as he encouraged back in Galatians 5, 16, when one truly walks in the Spirit, a single divine work takes place in the human soul that results in the production of a multitude of spiritual fruit. Now, having this type of understanding of the fruit of the Spirit can be revolutionary. It's a game changer. You see, many approach the fruit of the Spirit 
with the checklist mentality. Now we're good uh, with checklist. It's a part of our culture. Checklist, give me a list of things to do. Tell me what to do, I'll do it. Tell me what's expected, tell me what I must achieve and I'll get busy. So many times we look at Paul's virtue list or we look at scripture's list of virtues and we from our cultural understanding assume Paul's giving us a list of things we must do. Nine things, nine marks of a mature Christian. Let's talk about them tonight and this week let's get busy of trying to develop these things in our lives. I'm guilty of doing this. I approach the fruit of the spirit like this before. I've preached the fruit of the spirit like this. I had me a good nine part sermon series. Each week I preached on one of the fruit and told everybody how they were failing to exhibit such a godly character. Then I encouraged them to get busy, try to be more loving, try to be more joyful, try to be more patient, Try to have more peace in your life. Work on kindness, work on goodness, get better at faithfulness, get better at gentleness, learn self-control. Would perhaps even give some tips on how to assimilate such things into the Christian life. I want us to see that Paul's desire here, his aim, his intent was not to give us a checklist. We have to be careful that we don't have a natural Christianity. We want to aim for a supernatural Christianity. Paul is not encouraging a checklist. Paul was not into behavior modification. On the contrary, he is actually speaking against a checklist. He's actually speaking against mere behavior modification. So to study the fruit of the Spirit, we might think, well, we had an introductory series, and you said it's a 10-week series. I guess we're going to have nine messages now. That may make sense from a human perspective, but to study the fruit of the Spirit, I think we should take a different approach. And tonight, I want us to take a different approach by not diving in and defining what each of these virtues is and then encouraging us to go adopt them in our lives. Instead, I want us to start by looking at this idea of fruit, not fruits. Singular fruit. My first, one of my first jobs is at Kroger. Now, I've had people tell me, you had more jobs than anybody I've ever heard of. And so people have teased me. You've had a lot of jobs, and you talk about food a lot. So bear with me as I give another illustration from a job. But I remember uh, 14, 15 years of age working at Kroger at the Park Air Shopping Center in Marietta, and I got the tour of the facility, and they introduced me to the meat department, the seafood department. I remember we went to the produce department, and I remember seeing the banner hanging over all the tables with produce that said produce. I had no idea what produce was. I didn't know what is the produce department. I I don't know why, I just remember that. Seeing that sign and then him explaining to me, this is where we have all the fruits and vegetables. Produce, get it? It's like produced from the ground. It's produce. This is where we sell it. So I learned, wow, learned something new. I didn't know what produce, I didn't know what produce was. So when it comes to the Christian life, many times this word fruit is something we just don't grasp. We see it on paper, we've even quoted the fruit of the Spirit is, but for whatever reason we stay blinded to the context of Galatians and the real meaning of what Paul's trying to get across here. Tonight I want us to focus on three distinctions, three concepts concerning the fruit of the Spirit that will help us understand why Paul uses the word fruit singular and how the fruit appears in our life. Number one, consider this important distinction when it comes to the fruit of the spirit. Consider this spirit versus flesh. Spirit versus flesh. Paul's making in his writing here in Galatians for his readers a distinction between the way the spirit life works and the way the flesh life works. Paul wants believers to be aware that believers have been called to live not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit of God. 
You see this theme in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, where Paul asked this question. Actually, start in Galatians 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you, King James, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? What is Paul's beef here? What is his contention? What is the distinction he's trying to make? He knew that his readers were confused about the flesh and the spirit. They were opting for a man-centered, behavior modification-focused, flesh-driven religion, and they needed to learn to live the Christ life. They needed to tap into the the secret of a spirit-filled, spirit-driven religion. So he asked them, Galatians 3, 2, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? You see, they were trying to be perfected. They were trying to become mature by the works of the law. And Paul reminded them, you received the Spirit not by observing the Mosaic law and laws related to circumcision. You received the Spirit of God by believing through faith in what you heard, through faith, trust, and reliance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The moment you recognized your sin, the moment you understood that Jesus is your Savior, and in the moment you believed in him, you were pardoned of all of your sin, and you were born again. The Spirit of God came to live within your mortal bodies. You became a new creature in Christ. So why would you try to live the Christian life by the works of the law? Why would you seek after, Paul argues, Christian maturity through works? Christian life, Paul would argue. It's all about that new birth and learning to live in step with the Spirit of God. You perhaps know the background of the letter of the Galatians. They were legalists. Legalist in that they tried to earn salvation through keeping the Mosaic law. Legalist in that they believed one needed to be circumcised in order to be spiritually mature, spiritually strong, spiritually with it, and spiritual, spiritually pleasing to God. Now, the Mosaic law was indeed important, but we know this, the Mosaic law was intended by God to keep the Jews and the Israels distinct in the Old Testament from all of the surrounding pagan nations so that they could be a pure channel or conduit through which he could deliver the Messiah. And with Jesus coming, he fulfilled all of God's moral law. He fulfilled all of the ceremonial law. There was no need for the civil law anymore with the coming of the new covenant. And Jesus perfectly kept the Mosaic law on our behalf, the civil law and the ceremonial parts. And in Christ, believers are no longer called to keep the Mosaic law. Yes, we are still bound to God's moral law. He still calls us to live according to his moral standards, but the Mosaic law and regulation, ceremonial regulations like circumcision are not for New Testament believers. That's why Paul opened his letter in Galatians 1, 6 by saying, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. They were seeking to please God and to be saved and to be spiritually with it through keeping the Mosaic law. And that's why Paul here in our text says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, the Galatians were trying to be perfected. They were trying to live the Christ life through the flesh, through mere mechanical observances of religion. And Paul wanted them to know that they needed something so much more. They needed the Spirit. He wanted them to know that man-centered rules and regulations, a man-centered approach to Christianity, a flesh-oriented religion, 
preoccupied with externals alone would never produce things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so here he says, fruit, not fruits, to make a very important distinction. Whereas the works of the flesh came from a multitude of debased desires within the human heart. If one lived to li- learn to live the spirit life, Christ's character could be produced in their lives through the indwelling spirit of God from a singular source, the Holy Spirit. So if we want to be spiritually strong and if we want to be spiritually discerning, we've got to come to the place in our Christian walk where we see this important distinction between spirit and flesh. We must make sure that we, like the Galatians, don't have a flesh-centered religion focused on mere externals and devoid of a real focus on the Spirit of God. I can remember early in my spiritual journey just coming to the place I knew good and well that I could not by myself produce the life of Christ. I needed something more. I needed help. I needed God. I needed something from the other side. I needed the Spirit of God within me to do a change in my soul. This is Paul's point when he speaks of fruit, not fruits. Number two, there's a second distinction we can notice in Paul's words. We see a distinction of relationship versus religion. Paul wasn't the only one to use the fruit metaphor. You're aware of this, right? In John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus used this metaphor. Training his disciples on the Christian life, he said, Remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me, and I in him produces much fruit, because without me, you can do nothing. Now, Paul and Jesus both use this metaphor of fruit, and they used it in relation to a relationship. In doing so, they both prove that neither self-mastery nor a regiment of behavior modification techniques can produce the life of Christ. If you as a Christian want to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you need something more than seven steps. You need something more than a mere Bible study. You need something more than human discipline. You need a relationship with the living God that changes your heart, soul, and mind. And this is what Paul is pressing upon the Galatians. Undoubtedly, he knew of Jesus' teaching, so he used the metaphor of fruit. Tragically, Jesus' words have often been taken to refer only to soul winning. If you abide in me, you'll lead souls to Christ and you'll bear much fruit. Perhaps we could see the idea of soul winning in Jesus' word, but I think his words are all about Christian character. And that may result in leading others to Christ, but Paul expounds upon what Jesus meant by you'll bear much fruit by listing out nine fruit, nine virtues. Notice Jesus said that this fruit is produced when we remain in him word means to abide to stay to rest you could translate it to have one's home act and jesus in effect says the one who has his home or her home at or in me produces much fruit received a text message from a, a friend last night who lives down in Orlando. He's a soldier who was uh, discharged because of an injury he sustained in a car accident while serving in the Army and was an officer. And 
He's working now in Orlando and out of the military, and we're good friends with him. He's a Clemson grad and good friend, he and his wife and his daughter. Families have done a lot together. And so he texted me last night. We were texting while the football games were going on, and he said, we really need to come see you all soon. We're planning to do it. And I said, if you do come to see us, you've got a place to stay. You can stay at our place. We've got a guest room. If Jesus uses language that would speak of staying at a person's house to describe the Christian life. Christian life isn't about signing up for rules and regulations and requirements and rituals. I want to be careful to remind you, yes, there is law and rules in a sense in the Christian life, but the Christian life is first and foremost about an abiding relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And it is this relationship that produces the character of Christ, the spiritual fruit of which Paul speaks. It's not a checklist. It's not a spreadsheet of here are all my goals. It's not a I'm going to try better this week. Now there's a place for resolutions. There's a place for discipline. There's a place for having a well-ordered life that aids you in your spiritual development. But ultimately the life of Christ isn't produced through you and your flesh and your resolutions and your abilities and your energy, your effort. The life of Christ flows through the spirit of Christ within you. And you grow as a Christian when you learn to walk with God, to be at home in Christ, to live with him on a daily basis, to have your mind and your heart and your soul stayed upon him. You learn, you grow, and you develop as a Christian. You produce these nine things when you walk with God, regularly listening to what he says as you would in any relationship, regularly talking to him as you would in any relationship, regularly relating to his family as you would in any relationship. All all these things have a way of performing a supernatural work in your soul and producing the life of Christ, this virtue. It's a relationship. And it's this relationship for which we've been made. This is what it means to be human. It's also what it means to be Christian. You know, when Jesus baptized, he said something very important. I used to not be one who was a real stickler when we do things like the ordinances, baptism, Lord's Supper. I was for freedom, and I don't want us to be up too uptight tonight, but when it comes to baptism, I, I used to like people that were more informal and for it to be lighthearted and jovial. And again, I don't want to be too formal, but I don't know. The more I've considered Scripture and done these things, I think there's a lot of wisdom in how the Lord instructs us to do these things. There's one thing that I'll really, really press home if I'm training someone to baptize. Jesus said to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's very important. That should always be said when we baptize someone. Because Jesus said to say it, but also it reminds us of what's different about Christianity from every other world religion. It reminds us of what makes the Lord God. He is a trinity, three in one. Now, I've heard people say before, well, I'm struggling with Christianity. I can't get my mind around the trinity. You will never get your mind around the trinity. It's the whole point. He's God and he's different than we are and he is magnificent and he is eternal and he is infinite. He dwells in a trinity and the human mind cannot comprehend it. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Why is this trinity so important? This trinity reminds us that God is God and God alone and there is no other God, but it also teaches us that our God is a relational God. Some people have a trinity-less Christianity. How can God be love if there is not a trinity? There's no one for him to love before time began. There's perfect love between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How can God have love towards man without the trinity? He could not love you apart from his Son absorbing all of his wrath for your sin. His Son was a conduit 
of your love. So this Trinity is important. It tells us that our Lord is God. It also tells us that our Lord is a relational God. The Trinity also tells us that we have been made like God in his, his image, Genesis 1, to relate in a trinity of relationships as expressed in the great commandment. A trinity of relationships, it's me, my God, my Lord, and others. I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus taught us that this is true. John 17, 21, in praying for us, he said, may they all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. Jesus remarks on the fact that we as Christians are made for a trinity of relationships, connection with him, a connection with others. And it is this relationship with the Lord that produces, according to Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. It is this abiding that produces what Paul talks about in Galatians 5 22 virtues like faith excuse me virtues like love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control it's a relationship be careful however that you don't regard a Christian relationship as some loose mystical empty free-willing emotional willy-nilly thing Some people talk all about God just loves me. I've got a relationship and they know very little about God's word. Some people talk about their relationship with the holy God and they ignore the law of God. You can't have a relationship with God on your own terms. God is a holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When Isaiah saw the presence of God and was compelled to a relationship with God, He said, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst an unclean people. So we learn that this relationship is not this willy-nilly, loose, anything goes type of thing. Me and Jesus got a good thing going on. No, this is, there is a holy God who has a law he has for, for all of creation, And we have violated that law, but God loved us so much that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law for us, then died as a sacrifice, paying the penalty our law-breaking deserves. And now we can be forgiven, we can be brought into a right relationship with God, and we can relate to him through his son. Relationship. And is this relationship abiding in Jesus? Is this relationship listening to him regularly, hearing from him. It is this relationship, seeking him first in his kingdom that results in a supernatural work in our heart, souls, and minds that produces the life of Christ. Relationship versus religion. Let's look at one third distinction. And I'll call this one prognosis versus diagnosis. Y'all know the difference, perhaps. Why does Paul use the word fruit? It's instructive for us. His use of this word hints indeed at the fact that we need the Spirit. It hints indeed at the fact that we need a relationship. But we must see why Paul gives this list here. See, if we're not careful, we'll read our Bibles and we'll read about the fruit of the Spirit and we'll forget about the entire context of Galatians. These were people who were flesh-driven. They had a flesh-oriented religion. They were trying to please God through the flesh. So Paul's discussion of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit needs to be seen in that context. He lists out the works of the flesh to say, hey, you've got a flesh-oriented religion. You need to realize, here's what the flesh produces. It's never going to produce the life of God. And instead of having a flesh-oriented religion, you need a spirit-oriented religion. And here's what the spirit produces. And Paul holds these things up. A list. A diagnostic list, I would propose 
to encourage the Galatians to take a long, sober, humble, honest look in the mirror and to ask themselves whether or not they had these things in their lives. Sure, they may have kept the Mosaic law and committed themselves to circumcision and dietary customs, but if they weren't producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, it was doubtful whether or not they had really learned the secrets of the Christ life. See, seen in this way, Paul's word's not a checklist to follow. It is a diagnostic list that one should examine in order to discern whether or not one is really living according to the Spirit. This is Paul's purpose in giving list. It's not to say go and do these things, prognosis. It is to say, are you doing these things? diagnosis. Paul never intended for people to go out and try to produce love in their life, joy, peace, patience, or any of the other virtues. He wanted them to go live by the Spirit. That's it. It's the whole purpose. Live by the Spirit and you'll produce these types of things. So seen in this way, Paul's list is not prognosis. Here's the remedy. Go do these things. The list is diagnosis. So you know the difference, right? Sometimes a doctor gives a diagnosis. Sometimes there's a prognosis. You get a diagnosis and you hope you're going to get a prognosis, right? If you ever had a diagnosis and there is no prognosis or you have to wait, you heard people say, I hope they can tell me something. Sometimes you're hoping for the diagnosis. Sometimes you're hoping for the prognosis. Uh, Several years ago, my stomach had been upset all day. I've got a weak stomach and had a lot of pain. And so I did what any young man at that time would do. I called my mother. (laughs) My stomach's hurting. Well, you've probably got trapped gas. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to go get you some baked potatoes, cook about four of them, and salt and pepper them, and eat those baked potatoes, and that'll absorb the gas. All right? Baked potatoes it is. So I tried that. Laura, I told her, my mom's diagnosis, she got and looked online, things weren't getting any better. She said, well, trap gas, it says to maybe go for a run or something. Well, I like to run. I went out and ran three miles. Boy, it was hurting worse than ever after running three miles. I had to make a hospital visit up to Rome, and in my mind, I don't know why I thought this, your stomach's hurting. A a cookies and cream milkshake from Steak and Shake should make everything better. So I had that. Still wasn't getting any better. Uh, Laura checked out something online at that time and said, sounds like appendicitis. We went up to Floyd Hospital. Sure enough, And it was about that time those four baked potatoes and that milkshake came up in the sink in the waiting room there. So that was a diagnosis. After I gave an MRI, you have appendicitis, and the prognosis was we're taking it out. It looks pretty bad in the next couple hours. We're going to take that appendix out. So we read Paul's list, and many people think that he is offering a treatment in listing the virtues. They assume, Paul is saying, you need to do a better job at being loving, patient, kind, gentle, and so on. It's not Paul's aim. Paul's aim is to say, you need to learn to live by the Spirit, not the flesh. And if you want to discern right now whether or not you're living by the Spirit, ask yourself, are these things in my life? And if you see any, any area of deficiency, you should be humbled. You should be brought to your knees to seek after the work of the Spirit in your life. Because it's only the Spirit, not law-keeping. It's only the Spirit, not circumcision. It's only the Spirit, not Jewish dietary restrictions. It's only the Spirit that will produce the life of God. And that's why Paul said in Galatians 5, 16, 
I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's why he listed the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19. And we know that this list is not intended to be all the fruit of the Spirit there is. It's not intended to be a checklist. Christianity doesn't offer seven pillars or nine pillars at that we should seek after. It's just one, the gospel, the Christ life in us. We know that this is not an all-inclusive list because in Ephesians 5, 9 through 10, Paul would there say, walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. So it appears there's even more fruit he lists elsewhere. Should we go and dissect those words in our study? I don't think so. It just helps us see Paul's overall intent here. It's not necessarily to give us a list of virtues to follow after. His intent is to tell us to live the spirit life. Fruit, not fruits.